Hello guys, we're going to check out our fixer. Today we have this Martian, this is the 212 calculator. You can see it comes with a nice dust cover, which is really in pretty good shape. Um, also came with a couple of rolls of paper and the power cord. That's nice to have. Okay. Unwrap that then. Take this off and have a look here. This is really, still really flexible. It's really surprising. Um, usually these are you know, pretty dry out, but this is so pretty nice to get actually. Also came with the sales brochure, which is nice. Usually you don't get that. Um, and this machine was actually not made by Marchant. Um, this was made by Deal in Germany. This is the same thing as the Deal Decima, uh, which was a cheap alternative to the Transmatic. Um, so it's a 10 key uh, four function printing calculator. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that it does not, it's not a reciprocating machine, it's actually a rotary machine. Uh, we'll get a close look at that when we take it apart. Um, so a little overview, this is the brochure here, the Martian 212 printing calculator. Um, it was kind of falling apart, but I have a nice picture of it there. And then have a, some information about it. And then this also opens up into how to use it. Okay. Have a look at that. So it's uh, very nice to have. So before we plug this in and turn it on, I want to open it up and have a little look at it first. So I believe this has to come off. This is the keyboard clear. And this has to come off. This is the decimal adjustment for where you want your adjustment point to be, which is pretty cool. Uh, a whole lot of calculators had an automatic decimal point. If I can get this off. There we go. And it's got some screws in the side here, which I believe have to come out. And this machine, I believe, was introduced in 1967, um, which was after the introduction of electronic calculators. Um, but put that in perspective, in 1967, Sharp introduced the first electronic calculator under $1,000, and it was like 999 or 995 or something like that, so it wasn't much under $1,000. Um, and I'm not sure what this sold for in the U.S. as the Martian one, um, but the German version, um, the price in Germany, um, converts to around 600 US dollars in 1967 dollars. So uh, the conversion table I found is correct. So um, if that was correct, then this actually would have been, you know, significantly cheaper, like several hundred dollars cheaper than the cheapest electronic calculator. And if you needed printing, uh, I don't think there were any printing electronic calculators on the market yet um, in 1967. However, by 1970, when this machine, at least was discontinued in 1970, um, the picture had changed entirely. And in 1970, Sharp had introduced a handheld calculator that I believe sold for around $345. So, when this was introduced, this would have been about you know, $300 cheaper than the cheapest electronic calculator. But by the time it was discontinued, this was about $300 more than the cheapest electronic calculator. And that may not have been the cheapest one, I don't know, but that's just to uh, give you some idea of how things changed over the course of this machine's lifetime. But anyway, so we can take a look here, and you'll see right here, this is actually a pinwheel machine. Right here is the pinwheel cylinder. Um, this piece, I believe, is for carries. I'm not too sure about that, but that's what it looks like from here anyway. You can see the printer up here. Um, and the belt here, which is actually in pretty good shape. Um, I, have another, I have a deal transmatic that the belt just disintegrated in, so this belt is actually pretty good yet. Um, see if this is, it's not frozen, at least not here. Seems to be moving, because it's got some of my fingers now. Um, 
So just taking a little, you know, overview here. Uh, capacitor back there. Um, nothing seems, you know, to stand out at me. So um, I definitely wanted to get in and check this first. Because if this belt was all, you know, completely apart, then there's no sense in patterning it up. But given that it uh, seems to be fine, I think I might just plug this in just to see what happens. Um, if we can get the power cord out of its uh, shrink wrap thing here. Yeah, so luckily the paper holder is attached to this bottom piece, so you can still uh, load paper um, even with the cover removed. So I've loaded some paper, got the power cord plugged into the outlet. Let's just plug this in here. Let me get on the other side. Plug this in here and see what happens. Was stuck down. All right, so maybe there's something sticky in the keyboard or something. Uh, we can try adding something. Let's try. Well, maybe we could. This key is. It's all supposed to be. The keyboard is locked. Keyboard is locked, but you can see that it almost like frees up for a little bit. Um, so that completes one cycle and stops. Non add key. This retraction do. That one seems locked up. This doesn't seem to free anything up here. Something I'm noticing is that the pinwheel cylinder here is not rotating, um, which it should be for addition. So something is up, even when you run the addition cycle, so this is not rotating. I believe it should be for additions. So let me take a look at this for a minute and see if I can figure out. This seems pretty solid too. Uh, let's see if I can figure out what exactly is going on with that. Okay, so one thing I figured out so far, the reason the keyboard was locked is because the machine was not stopping at the end of the cycle. Um, so this rod right here is the keyboard lock. So when it's like this, which is what it was like, that locks the keyboard and you can't enter anything. So this is controlled by a cam here and I manually rotated it so that the cam allowed this rod to retract and now you can enter stuff. And this of course clears out the keyboard. So that's one thing figured out. Um, why the machine is not stopping in the appropriate place, so we also need to figure that out too. Um, but let's see if we try adding when something's entered on the keyboard, if it rotates the pinwheel cylinder here. So let's try one, two, three. Nope, same thing. All it wants to do is clear the keyboard and doesn't want to add anything. So um, further investigation is required. All right, so I've been playing around with this and trying different things for quite a while now. Um, so I think, I'm not sure where we last left off on the video, um, but what I've discovered is that there's two, um, 
are basically two main entry drive points for this machine. So the first one, which we've already looked at, is this right here for the pinwheel cylinder. Um, this is actually a dog clutch right here, so this can freewheel. And then when this engages, then the pinwheel cylinder rotates. Um, the other one is right down, right around in here. I'm sure if you can, whoops. Sure if you can see this lever right there um, engages the dog clutch for the main shaft that runs across the bottom. Um, that one's still a bit sticky. Um, I'm not playing into that yet, but. So right now, both those dog clutches are disengaged, so the entire machine freewheels. I can spin this, and the only thing that spins are the input gears here, and the motor and its input gear here, and of course this belt that connects them. So nothing on the machine operates when it's in this state. Um, I've also learned that I think I was incorrect in thinking that the pinwheel cylinder should engage for addition. After playing around this a little bit, it looks like possibly that only engages for uh, multiplication and division when you need like high speed repetitive adding, um, is my current theory. And the reason for that is because looking at the bottom of this machine, you can kind of see in here, you can see that the rails, like you can see a row of rails right in there. Those run from all the way in the back, all the way down to the front um, under the keyboard. And it looks like they operate similar to the way a reciprocating machine does, where you know the pressing keys on the keyboard hit pegs in the pegboard, and then the risers you know, uh, come down to meet those pegs. Um, that part isn't quite working so far. Um, the risers seem to be always going to the maximum extent, which would be a nine. And here if you can see, I tried to spray a little bit of WD-40 on the ribbon to see if I get it to print. Uh, it didn't really work, it's just making WD-40 imprints, but it's all nines all the way across the page. Um, so that's one issue. Um, the other issue is that the stop, the, the dog clutch on the shaft across the bottom is sticky. Um, a few things that were sticky that I fixed were these levers right here, so you can see these are supposed to be spring loaded like that when I pull it, it swings back. That was super stiff before. Um, I had to like pry it with a screwdriver to get it to move. And the reason why I was playing around with that is because when I was initially playing with this machine, uh, the machine jammed, and it jammed because this lever here uh, rides on a cam on the main shaft in there, so there's a cam that, you know, moves this bit forward and back on the main shaft as it rotates. And then there's some teeth, I'm not sure if you can see, but see, you can just see the end of the tooth there moving. There's some teeth on that piece that move a, that engage with some teeth on this, which seem to, which would rotate this shaft, which seems to raise and lower these four, or not these four, but these small set of wheels down in here, which seems to be like some kind of small register possibly. And what was happening was, when that rotates to lift that register up and down, this mechanism over here moves backwards and forwards. So I know it's in the forward position. When it moves backwards, it was hitting on the top of this because when the machine's in motion, this moves up. You can see, I think you can see, there's a cam here, so when this rotates, this piece gets pushed out like that on the cam right there, which causes this to lift up, and then there's a pin on this piece, which is hitting against that and causing the machine to jam. So the only way I could get the machine unjammed was to try and disengage the teeth from the uh, register rotating teeth, um, which allowed the register to remain down while this piece came forward and didn't jam against uh, this piece over here. Um, so I loosened that up so that hopefully that will fix that problem. We'll have to obviously see if that recurs or not, but um, that's one thing that I fixed, or well, that I think I might have fixed. Um, so what do we have right now? So right now what we have is the machine is currently in its home position. 
um, I can enter like one, two, three on the keyboard um, because in the home position it's unlocked. Now I can push non add, that latch is down. And then I'm not gonna, um, I don't have this plugged in right now, but what I can do is I can grip the end of this shaft. So this would rotate like so. And it does its printing. And I'm just gonna come back. And right there, it you can see it disengages the out key, it's back in the home position. The problem that I'm currently having, well, I'm having many problems, but the one that I'm focusing on right now is you can see that the lever down in there, maybe you can see anyway, the lever down in there is now pushing against the pin of the, um, the dog clutch when it's supposed to be on top of that pin. So if I go down in here and I push that pin down a little bit, I think I can do. See, now it's latched under that lever. You can see that. Now the pin is latched under that lever and that's what is supposed to happen at the end of the cycle. So what's currently happening is because that lever isn't capturing that pin, it allows this shaft to basically freewheel into the next cycle um, which, for whatever reason, um, I guess because it's already released the key and basically cuts the motor, um, it freewheels into the next cycle until it hits some resistance and then stops in the middle of the next cycle. So um, I can demonstrate that by plugging it in now. So we'll plug it in here, and of course right now it's, you know, Nothing's engaged, so I'll put something on the keyboard. Well, like I said, it shouldn't matter because right now it's pointing all nines all the time, so we have to look into that too. If I push non add, so you see where the machine stopped is halfway through the next cycle. And because of that, the keyboard and everything is all locked, although the non add key is not locked. Not sure if that's a problem or not. So you can kind of bump it. until it gets around to the home position, or you can just take this and bring it there. Um, and now that lever is latched on top of that pin so it would stop there. So theoretically I shouldn't be able to turn this any further, I don't think. Now see it stops against that pin, which is what's supposed to happen. So I need to figure out what's causing that Latch the mechanism to not capture that pin. Um, and once we figure that out, hopefully we can get this machine to reliably stop at the end of each cycle. Um, which will just make it a lot easier to troubleshoot. You know, if every time you hit a button, the you have to go back and reset the machine, it's just a lot more annoying and time consuming to play around with it. So that's what I'm gonna look into first. And then once I get it stopping reliably at the end of the cycle, the next thing I'll probably look into is why it's always uh, printing nines because that uh, is not correct. All right, so I ended up um, pretty much taking most of this apart. Uh, so we can get a bit of sorry view here. So I took the big snapping off here to pull that plate forward. Uh, snapping off there, there. These two came off. Then I pulled this whole belt assembly forward a little bit. I didn't take it off because. This piece can't come off. This gear, which is part of this this piece here, uh, is behind this plate. So I just threw it forward far enough to get this plate out, this rock arm out, which has to come out with this piece because the shaft that goes in there has a ridge on the back side, so I have to take those both off as an assembly. Took the spring off of this post, um, took this piece out, uh, this piece out, um, and then I was able to move, like I said, I took this off, slid this big gear in the back forward, the gear that has the doll clutch on it, and then this lever I was able to take another snapping off down there and pull that forward to clean up the shaft. And now you can see this whole trip. And if I reset the dog here, let me can get away that you can see this. You can see it springs right forward right away. So that seems to be better. So we're gonna plug this in and see if our uh, non-add works now.
or if I put it back together, I'll it just jams. So I shouldn't say not add work, because it's not going to work. There's some other, other issues with it. But by the way, it stops at the end of the cycle. So let's see. Uh, just understand I know it doesn't matter. That's more promising. So now you can see that it positively stopped right there at the end of the cycle, and then the motor and belt assembly just freewheel. But the important part is that this plate here is right at its home position, and the keyboard should be unlocked, and it is. So we can try that again. Exactly. And try, see what addition does. Okay, the key sticks, but the machine stops at the right cycle. So the addition key sticks down and keeps the motor powered, but the actual mechanism seems to stop appropriately. So that's good. Um, it looks like my WD-40 impressions are basically gone. I don't think I can see. Yeah, I can't, I can't see anything at all on that paper. So um, we're gonna have to change the ribbon now um, because otherwise I can't see anything the machine is doing. Like there's no impression or anything left on there, which is kind of annoying. Yeah, there's nothing at all. There's no input of anything. That's weird. So I'm gonna have to change it over just so I can see what exactly is happening because, like I said uh, before, you can see the imprints. Oh, you can't see the imprints. Uh, before you can see the imprints here barely. This is just all nines, but now you can't see anything, even though it is trying to print. So I'm gonna have to change the ribbon so I can see what's going on, see if it's still printing on nines, which I'm sure that it is. Um, and that'll be the next thing to diagnose. And once we can get the keyboard to match the output, then we'll see if it'll actually add. Um, I don't think the total key's locked, so that's. Uh, Total and subtotal are locked. Minus is locked. So we're gonna have to figure out what to do about that. Um, hmm. Alright, so we're gonna change ribbon first, see what it's printing, and I think if it's still printing on nine, we're gonna diagnose that next. But this machine has definitely got a lot of problems. Okay, so I was able to get this to actually print something and enter on the keyboard. You can see right here I printed one, two, three. Um, and that was just by, well, I'll explain some of the details later, but I did that by manually turning it over. Um, so now I'm going to try with it, you know, with the motor turning it over and see if it will also work that way. So let's try four, five, six, and we'll hit non add. And nothing happens. And the reason for that, I think I know what it is. So we'll reset that. Um, this mechanism here likes to attempt to engage itself, which is what it's done. See if we can shove that back over. Reset that. Okay. It's going to cooperate now. No, hold on a minute. I'll see what happens now. I've still got my four, five, six enter on the keyboard. See if I hit this. And there you go, print out four, five, six. Exactly like we wanted it to. However, the machine did not stop in its appropriate place. So you can see it's continued past the end of the cycle, so I still have to. Another problem I have to figure out, it was working when I was turning it over by hand, so I have to look into why it's doing that again. Um, the issue which I'm having is, you can see this right here is a, right under here, this piece that's spring-loaded, which you can see or not, is a dog clutch for the pinwheel shaft here. And I haven't figured out why yet, but that, Thing slowly starts to engage itself, and when then when that happens, um, this piece here can't move up because it hits against a piece that's interacting with that clutch, and that's why when I first hit the key, it didn't engage 
the dog clutch on the main shaft because this piece couldn't go up, which is attached down here to that locking clutch release. Um, so I have to figure out, that's one thing I have to figure out. Now the machine didn't stop at the end of the cycle, so I have to figure that out as well. I'm not quite sure why that happened exactly. So if we can turn it over by hand to get to the end of the cycle here. A lot of time it stopped at the end, so. Interesting, I'm not sure why I didn't do that before. Let's try it again. We do seven, eight, nine. And that happened again. So let's see. Yeah. I have to figure out why this, so you can see this, this arm here needs to go over that way. I'm not sure what the deal is with that. Figure that out yet. All right, let's try it again. Should still have it entered. And then now it jams. Try turning it over by hand, no. Here's the issue here. Try to trip this manually. Can't do because this see this clutch engaged again. That's the issue. For some reason, this clutch keeps trying to engage itself. We can, um, yeah, this thing keeps trying to engage itself. So I have to play with that for a minute. Right, let's see what happens this time. Let's try some random number here. Print it out. Try a bunch of nines. And it does nothing. Something is not engaging again. This stupid thing over here. Let's try that again. So that was... Five nine. Let's try. Let's try going all the way to the end. It's all the way at the end. See. One. We have to figure this stupid thing out over here. This is, I think it's engaged now. Now the panel mechanism is engaged for some reason. Now it's disengaged itself. Now that is free. Let's see what happens if I push non add now. Nothing, still. Because this can't go over. Why? Oh, because that's in the way, so this has to be just a little tiny bit. No, maybe. And they didn't stop at the end of the cycle that time. That time it kind of did. It's not stopping any of the cycle again, so we're gonna have to see what the deal is there. I'll try turning it by hand. Keeps tripping the release at the end of the cycle. I'm not sure what it is. 
play on that for a while, but at least we're getting it somewhere. So it is printing now, um, and it's actually printing what we entered on the keyboard before it was entering all zeros. Um, now it is actually entering what we put on the keyboard. So I'll see if I can explain what changes I did to get, or what I, was, what I did to get that to work, but first I wanna figure out why it's not stopping at the end of the cycle anymore. Okay, so. Quite sure what the issue was. Um, ran the machine through a few cycles by hand. You know, tried to manually reset anything that got jammed, and this is where we're at now. Um, so the issue, one of the issues that we were having before was it was printing all nines, and I think then it started printing all zeros, and it was not listening to the keyboard input, um, and the cause of that was um, to be able to see, but this machine seems to be basically like kind of two separate machines put together um, where the, like the addition, subtraction, total and subtotal parts are basically a reciprocating machine and then the multiplication and division parts add in a rotary machine kind of on top of that. So the reciprocating machine can operate independently of the rotary machine. So whenever you're doing addition and subtraction, the rotary part, which is the pinwheel cylinder here, the carry drum behind it, and I think the register for that is right underneath that. I'm not exactly sure. Um, that part doesn't get involved, as far as I can tell, for addition and subtraction. Um, so that, you know, the cut, the... Um, dog clutch here is stay disengaged or supposed to stay disengaged unless you're doing a, a multiplication division as far as I can tell. Um, so the rotary machine part of it has risers that go all the way from the back all the way down through the bottom to right down in the front here under the uh, keyboard. And the rotary, that part of the rotary machine is pretty similar to what you'd expect where you, the keyboard advances a pegboard where each key pushes down a peg corresponding to that number in that column. And then when the machine runs, the risers slide up. I'm not sure you'll be able to really see them because they're right down in the bottom here. You can, yeah, you can see the ends of some of them right there. So those are the risers there. So when you're doing a non-add addition or subtraction, those risers rise up and they have little hooks on the end of them that will be stopped by the peg sticking out of the keyboard. Now, for some reason on this machine, which is something I haven't really seen before on other um, uh, reciprocating machines, those can actually be disengaged and the hooks on the front of the risers are actually pivoted. Um, so what we was happening before was they were pivoted down and so they weren't catching on the bottom of the pins and everything was rising all the way up to nine and printing all nines. Um, to get them to engage, I had to change the timing of a piece, which I'll show you in a minute, and that caused them to um, rise up during the machine cycle and actually hit on the bottom of the pegs and print the number that they were supposed to. And the piece that I changed was, this, sure you can see this right here, um, this like kind of star shaped thing is on the end of a shaft and that shaft runs through, uh, down here, runs all the way through there and you can see there's a whole bunch of cams on that shaft um, doing all different kinds of things. One of those cams um, has a lever that goes over to release a latch. So, and that latch is what raises and lowers these. So basically there is a, cam on the, well there's many cams on the back shaft, one of the cams on the back shaft um, causes a lever in, that runs all the way from there all the way up to the front to go backwards um, towards the back of the machine as the machine is going through the cycle and that lever has a peg sticking out of it 
And that peg can either engage or disengage with a lever that comes over to raise and lower these. So basically the order of operation for the peg, the um, logic to engage or disengage with the pegboard is when the machine starts to cycle, or at some point in the cycle when that lever starts moving backwards, the um, lever that comes off of here has to engage with a peg on that lever so that as that lever goes backwards, it kind of rotates an assembly in the front here forwards, or well backwards actually, towards the back of the machine and that lifts up the front ends of these risers here to engage with the pegs on the bottom of the pegboard. And the way that, when I was first looking at this, the way that the shaft over here with all the different cams on it was timed, um, it was timed so that the lever that, com that comes over to engage with the rearward lever um, was always disengaged and therefore was never lifting these pegs up or lifting these risers up in the up direction to engage with the bottom of the, the pegboard to um, you know, enter the number into the machine. So I changed the timing of that. I have no idea where the timing that is supposed to be. There doesn't seem to be any direct connection. Um, the only thing I can see that rotates this shaft here is there's some ratchets, which you know you can't really tell from here, but one of these levers in here has a hook on the end of it that engages with a ratchet on this shaft and kind of just pulls the shaft um, around to rotate it. But what the timing of it is supposed to be, you know, by default, I really don't know. So we're just gonna have to see if we can figure that out as we go along. So whether I have it now, it seems to work for non-add. Um, we can try doing an addition and just see what happens. If I can raise this back up here. I haven't tried addition yet. Um, so yeah, so that was one issue was the risers weren't engaging. Um, another issue that I had was the machine just jammed itself uh, when I was playing around with it. It took me a while to figure out what was causing it. And what I figured out was that the last two risers that run all the way through the length here on this side um, are different than the rest of them. They don't engage with the pegboard and they don't have teeth on them in the same spot. Uh, what the point of them is I really don't know, but they had locked up against one of the registers in the bottom and that register was engaged at a time as far as I can tell when it shouldn't have been engaged and that was preventing the those two last garages from returning to the home position which had jammed the machine and it took me a while to figure out how to get the register to disengage and allow those garages to return home and it turned out that there was a catch basically somewhere that you can't see it buried all the way down in here and as soon as I, I pushed that catch, the register popped down and the levers returned to their home position. But it, it's going to be impossible for me to show you that really because it's buried down in the, in the machine. And it took me quite a long time to figure that out and find that it was causing that to jam. Uh, so what caused that, I really don't know. Um, there are parts of this machine that are so kind of sticky with dry grease and don't always you know, spring back like they're supposed to. So that is an issue that we're going to continue to be fighting here. Um, but... Yeah, these machine, these uh, full keyboard, not full keyboard, four, four function um, printing machines usually are pretty complicated. I mean, all four function machines are pretty complicated, but for some reason the printing machines seem to be more so. But anyway, so let's see. So where are we here? We can do this, we can do that, and it prints out. Now what happens if we try to add? Well, I got an equal sign instead of a plus sign. I don't know if that's what that means. Um, it did go through though. Let's try four, five, six. So we're getting equal signs. Uh, can I do a total? Well, well, it totaled out something. What happens if I try it again? Oh, it cleared out. Okay, let's try. My ribbon advance is not working. There's something. It's getting fainter. Anyway, let's try a total now. Hey, it works. That's surprising. 
I didn't expect it to work. Um, so now addition works, totaling works. And it actually clears out, so that's a good sign. So let's see if subtotaling works. Let's try 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, blah, 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 whatever. So if we do a subtotal, prints out the subtotal. If we do a total, prints out the total. That's good. And it does, in fact, clear out. All right, let's try subtraction and see what trouble we can get into with that. So let's try 45, and let's try subtracting 5. I did that, and now let's try total. And of course, there went the paper on the floor because I didn't have a whole roll in. And as you can see, it did in fact work, maybe. 45, and so 45 minus 5 is, in fact, 40. So, honestly, I expected something worse to happen when I tried that, um, given the way things have been going with this machine. Let's see if we can flip the paper around and put it back in the other direction here. Uh, this piece is broken. Um, there's, there's supposed to be plastic all around here that holds it on here, but this side is broken off. So that's why this is kind of flopping around. I kind of want to keep it out of the way so it doesn't get damaged. I just want to figure out what's up with my ribbon advance not operating. Um, I may have something put back together wrong because I had taken, you know, I was trying to figure out why the machine had jammed. I had taken this piece and kind of like lifted it up and off. Um, not all the way off because it's kind of attached down here at the bottom. I, taken this and flipped it up, and to do that I had to d d take apart some of these levers here, so we I just have something um, connected incorrectly. But I don't think this moves, this moves, but I don't think that's the issue. Well, anyway, um, okay, so what can we try next? I have a feeling if I try multiplication it's not going to work, um, but we can try it anyway. Looks like even like something is entered into this register already, so I don't know what that means. Um, as you can see, I'm assuming this is the multiplier register or the counter register, and you can see all these little fingers are pointed forward except for this one. And I have a feeling these are what the machine uses to know whether something is entered in a particular column or not. Um, to kind of act as trips, you know, so if it's a zero, it skips that column, or It'll you know keep adding until they get to zero or something like that. I'm assuming, uh, but this one is there already something else. I don't know if that means anything, but just for fun, let's try multiplication. Let's try five multiply by five, and I don't expect this to work, but let's just see. Oh, it actually did something. We ended up with 2000.00. So, huh. And that register has, in fact, cleared itself out. That's kind of cool, I guess. We can try that again. We'll try five. It's not printing that. I don't know if that means anything. And try five. And we've got a whole bunch of nines. Let's try a total. And now the machine's locked up again. Yeah, something's messed up here. So it tried to work, didn't quite get all the way there. What cycle am I? I am in the home position, but total and subtotal are locked out. Addition seems to work. Better. No, something, for some reason it keeps printing 99. Eight, nine, and then a whole bunch of zeros. Not quite sure what the deal is with that, but some total worked. Try a total. All right, so we're cleared out again now. And let's just try that again. We'll try five. And multiply by five. And they put it out as zero. Although it did engage, you can, I'm not sure if you saw that or not, but it did engage the um, pinwheel section, so I just kind of confirm my theory that this part only comes into play during multiplication and division, though it doesn't seem to be working correctly. 
Um, oh, you know what? This has automatic decimal stuff. I wonder if that's affecting this. Let's try 5.00. Um, I guess you can only see, I, the decimal point I think right now is set to two because everything prints out with two decimal points. Um, so if I do 500, that should be 5.00. Let's try that. And then multiply by 5.00. And we got a whole bunch of 499999995. So that didn't quite work. Let's try total. So machines total it out. Let's try that again. 5.00 times 5.00. Hey, there we go. Now it worked. Can you see that on the camera? I think you can see that. So now we've got. Move it in just in case. Now we've got five reflection there. Five times five is twenty five point zero zero. So I wonder if that was my issue before. Basically what I was telling the machine to do was point zero five times point zero five, which would obviously be you know would have too many decimal points for the capacity when it's only set to two. Um, so I think that the automatic decimal point was messing me up there. I'm not used to having that on these machines. Uh, so that's so pretty good actually. I'm pretty excited that that managed to work. Um, let's see, do we do try division? Uh, let's see, do we have a total? Total is zero. You can do, let's do something simple. Let's do 25.00 uh, divided by and then we'll do 5.00 and see what happens. And it worked, we got 5.00. See that? 25.00 divided by 5.00, zero remainder and five quotient. That's pretty exciting. We try something bigger. Um, see, so I think I um, kind of want to change the decimal point setting. I don't know what, I think if I push it all the way down, it should be maximum decimal points. So let's just see what happens. We'll try 355 divided by 113. And that didn't quite work. Now we're getting nothing. All right, let's try. You go all the way up, there should be four decimal points. So now we can do, say, 355 and then four zeros divided by 113 and one, two, four zeros. All right, so that seemed to work. So we got 355 divided by 113, and you can see that the decimal point moves to show you, you know, exactly where it, where it is, because it's automatic, that's kind of cool. Uh, that would be the remainder, and then the quotient down there, 3.1415, so that works. So uh, I'm not sure why it didn't work. Maybe I'm just using it wrong. I'm not exactly sure how that maximum decimal setting is supposed to work. I can probably check my pamphlet. I think there's an example of how to use it in there. Um, but that's pretty exciting. We all cleared out. And of course it's going to print, you know, 0 0.40 because we're on decimal setting 4. So that's pretty exciting. So let me give you a top view. You can see the multiplier work. Let's change this back down to 4. I think we're right there. How many settings do we have here? That's, I'm looking at the case to see what I'm setting this to. So the top one is four, I think. And then we've got three, two, that should be zero, and then max decimals at the bottom. So let's try setting it to zero, and let's do 625, give you an overview here. You can see this mechanism in Engage, and what it does, and we'll do multiply by 625, and then equals.
And there you go, 625 times 625 is 390625. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, it's pretty interesting how, you know, it's half the time it's a reciprocating machine and the other half the time it's a rotary machine. That's uh, pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm probably just gonna play around this a little bit more and see if I can find any other issues and see if I can figure out how to use that maximum decimal point setting. Um, I kind of have a feeling that eventually some issues are gonna crop up because like I said, there are some parts in here that I, that I know are so kind of sticky. So see if I can hunt those down and loosen them up. Um, but otherwise, uh, this is definitely, I did not expect all of this to work like this. Um, and given how many issues I've had with just trying to get non-add to work, um, the fact that I got non-add working and then everything else seemed to just work is honestly kind of exciting. Uh, I did not expect that. But yeah, so definitely pretty happy with this so far. Um, but like I said, I do have kind of a feeling that some of the issues are going to crop up. So I'll get playing around with this and uh, see where it goes. Something I wanted to play on this machine is it looks to me like that's been either braised or silver soldered or something. You kind of see the, it looks like solder on the inside there, um, which is kind of interesting, I think. Um, most of the machines that, you know, use parts like this where it's a stamped metal piece attached to a hub like that, they usually just kind of either press it in or stake it in or something. Don't usually see a lot of that uh, silver soldering or whatever kind of soldering or brazing they did there. Um, and that's not the only place I've seen this. This machine is full of stuff like that, you know, all the way down in the bottom and all over the place. A lot of times where they attach a stamped piece to a hub like that, they either braze or silver soldered or whatever. But not always, because you can see up here, it looks like they just staked that one on there. I don't see any solder around the backside. So it's kind of interesting. Um, you don't see a lot of that. All right, so it's a few days since the last uh, part of this video. Um, reason being, I ran into an issue with this machine, which I predicted would happen. Um, like I said, there were still some sticky parts and I expected that to reoccur at some point. And it did, a uh, division broke on this machine. And I've been spending the last few days fighting with it. So what we were getting, I'll show you the paper here. The uh, nice thing about uh, these printing machines is I can show you the results without having to record everything. Um, so we see stuff, we were getting stuff like this, 25 divided by 5 equals 25, which is obviously wrong, or 25 divided by 5 equals 50, which is obviously wrong. Same thing again there, 625 divided by 5 equals 650, again obviously wrong. Uh, 125 divided by 5 equals 125, so kind of get the idea, um, almost like it was adding instead of subtracting or something. and so. I'm spending the last few days, uh, obviously not all day, but you know, a couple hours here and there um, after work or whatever, trying to figure out what was going on with this. Um, and of course, you know, as we know, a division is handled by the pinwheel part in the front. And I've concluded that the register for the pinwheel piece is all the way down in there. These gears, I don't think are the gears for it. I think they're just intermediate gears that drive it. I'm not exactly sure of that because I can't see in there. Um, but I think, like, I think you can't actually physically see any part of the register except for when it slides out the side here. Because the whole register slides, um, obviously, for, you know, entering into different positions in the register. And I think I finally figured out what the problem was. Um, it's so simple, I couldn't believe this was it. But... Um, so let's go over a little bit of what we know so far. So right now we know that the timing of this shaft is critical. You can see it kind of has this star wheel on the end. And there's a whole bunch of cams in here. You can kind of see them down in there. There's little uh, wafers on that shaft are all cams that do a whole bunch of timing functionality. And like I mentioned before, there's nothing that positively affects that. You know, it's not like gear driven or shaft driven or anything. It just has little latches. I'm not sure if you can see, um, but there's gears on the shaft. Let me get a point, something to point with. I'm not sure if you can see right there. That's a gear, and there's a little ratchet right there that engages with that gear to pull it to rotate the shaft, but that's it. So there's nothing that 
positively times it to the rest of the machine. It just has to be set in the right position for the ratchet to drive it to the correct position for whatever the functionality is next. Now, for when you're doing regular adding machine stuff like addition, subtraction, totaling, subtotaling, this does not move. It just stays in the home position. Um, and we can kind of guess where the home position is based on whether or not adding works. So if you remember when we first got this machine, um, one of the issues was the number entered on the keyboard was not reflecting in the printer. And we deduced that to the um, risers have hinged portions on the front that can either hinge up to engage with the pegs on the bottom of the keyboard or hinge down and make the keyboard irrelevant. And they were stuck hinged down. And we had traced that to the camshaft here being out of time. Um, one of the cams was holding, let me see if I can actually show this. It's gonna be kind of hard to see. One of the really cool things about this machine is this. It hinges off the base and actually has a little prop in the back so you can prop it up like that. Now this would be useful for oiling. It's not as useful for trying to diagnose because you kind of have to look up underneath and try and see where everything is. So it's kind of hard to do that. Um, but it's definitely nice to just take two screws out of the front here and the whole thing just hinges up. Um, I've actually flipped this machine upside down. Um, there's enough of the frame sticking up that it can just rest on that and then hinge the base off and look at it straight on um, to get a better view of what was going on. Um, so let's see if we can get in here. It's gonna, like I said, it's going to be kind of hard to see because you have to kind of look up and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get a proper angle to see some stuff. So you can see right here is the bottom of that cam shop and here are the little cams on it. Um, let's see which level it was. It was this one right here. Yeah, this one right here. So you can see this lever is attached to this cam right here. And what this lever does is, um, if you remember, this piece rocks, and that's what raises the hinged portions up to engage with the keyboard. So when this rocks forward, the uh, risers here, you can see the bottoms over here, the bottom of the teeth. The risers here will engage with the keyboard and register the keyboard result. So when this pieces like this, um, here we, we can see. So right now it's in a valley on its cam disc, which it has to be, um, because when it's in a valley on the cam disc, I'm not sure if you can really see, but up in here, actually you can kind of see it, maybe. You see in here? Not really. I'm sure if I can get a better view. Anyway, through this little window here, which you still can't see. Let's see if we can. And there. So this peg right here will move towards the back of the machine during a cycle. It's attached to a rider that rides on one of the cams on the back shaft. So when the back shaft engages and that cam rotates around, it pulls this peg here, which is attached to a lever, towards the back of the machine. And you'll notice that right above that, there's a cutout in this little lever here. Um, that cutout needs to drop down onto that peg as it moves backwards, and that's what pulls the keyboard forward. So let's see, if I poke this, can you see that moving? So see how that moves when I poke the thing here? So when that, when this shaft is pulled back by this peg, it rotates this assembly and causes the hinged portion of the front of the riser to come up and engage with the keyboard. So in order for this to be free to drop down, you can see it's um, latched up on this now, but that's because that's for another functionality. Um, let me try and rotate this here and hopefully not mess up my timing again. Wrong direction. Ooh. That one's kind of messed up. Let's see. So, what do we see? Can we see? Yeah, see how the, a peg appeared there now? So that's what happens when it's out of time. Right now, this lever 
which you can see is moving, I think. Yeah, so this lever which is moving is attached to the riser that rides on the small cam in the front here. So as soon as I move that riser, you can see that lever moving. And you can see what's going to happen now, even if this piece moves out of the way, is that this shaft is going to be blocked from dropping down by the peg hitting that little riser there. I think you can see that. Actually, you can't see the peg, that's why. We can... A better view here. Can you see? Yeah, so just right at the top, see how there's a peg right on top of the piece I'm moving? That peg is attached to this shaft and will prevent it from dropping down one last at a time. So that was one of the issues that was causing the pegboard, or was causing the risers to not register the um, keyboard result. So if I rotate this again, hopefully, to double check and see if that's the home position. But now you can see that that has moved out of the way and then when this catch releases here, this will be free to drop down and register the keyboard result. Um, so that was one issue. And that's really the only thing that I've kind of like seen that was wrong. Um, I think the other issues with the machine jamming and stuff may have just been related to, you know, that shaft being out of time. Um, I'm thinking anyway, we can drop this back down because I haven't really noticed anything like specifically wrong except for one other thing, which didn't really seem like it was a big deal. Not to be, let's see. So I think now we are in the correct position. We'll find it in a minute if it doesn't work. Um, let's bring this back up. So, Okay, so once I got, once I fixed that, then you saw in the last portion of the video, the machine seemed to pretty much work. We were able to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Let's plug it back in here and see if it's still gonna work. Let's tuck this down. Back there somewhere. So let's see if we can get some results here. We will. Put it back to zero decimal points. So addition works. Multiplication works. So I think I'm pretty confident I'm back and I got that set to the right timing. Now the other issue which again, it didn't seem like it was a big deal. You can see that this piece here is spring-loaded. Maybe you can see. And you, I hope you can see that this spring-loaded piece here is basically just the detent for the star wheel on the outside to detent that camshaft into a position. Um, and this piece was completely frozen. So after spending you know, I don't know how many hours trying to figure out what was wrong with division. I, I was I was just about ready to like give up on this for a while and put it away and come back to it later. I was kind of getting tired of not getting anywhere. Um, and I noticed that this was stuck down. So I thought, well, may as well just free that up. I don't think that's the problem, but you know, it should be done just to, because the, obviously they put that detent there for a reason. And when it was stuck down like that, it wasn't doing any detenting. So I took that off, cleaned it up, put it back on, and wouldn't you know, division started working. You can see that. 3.1415 works. So I spent I don't know how many days trying to figure out what was wrong with division when the only issue was this little detent here was not detenting that camshaft and it must have been that the camshaft somehow was not sitting in the right position to allow division to work. And I was getting those funky results that I showed earlier.
the uh, camera I remember there, but um, in the meantime, I cleaned up the keyboard, um, cleaned up this knob and this thing. Um, I got some oil on that when I was playing off the machine. Um, so, uh, also, I fixed this paper holder. Um, I remember this side kept coming loose because there was a piece of plastic broken off in the back, so I just took some epoxy uh, putty and remade that piece. I don't think that would be visible, so it should be fine. Um, so yeah, um, also if you remember before, um, when we tried setting this on the max decimal point setting for division, it jammed, and now it works just fine. You see that's the result there uh, for max decimal points. So apparently all the, well not all the issues, but most of the issues are related to this piece, this cam shaft here being at a time. Um, I don't know why it worked for multiplication and not division, so I'm not sure about that. Um, and the only thing I can think of for why it worked before is you know, maybe that shaft was somewhat sticky, and so before, uh, without that detent working, it just the stickiness of the shaft was acting kind of like a detent, and that allowed it to work for division and multiplication, but I guess then once that shaft loosened up, then it was you know overstepping um, and not, not being aligned properly. It's the only thing I can think of anyway. Um, so you can see I put this uh, bottom piece back on, and this doesn't actually like attach to the machine um, in any way. Itself, it's just loose. You can't really. It'll be somewhat. I think it's stuck on the feet, but this should just lift up. I think. Because there's just holes in the bottom for the feet to go through. It doesn't actually screw into any, anything on the machine itself, but. Let me show you loose that. So I don't think maybe I have it all wrong, but when the top goes on, um, and see these pieces stick out from the top and then they screw into the bottom. So the, the bottom and top are basically free floating on the frame and just these rubber bumpers here on the side um, kind of keep them in place. I think they should go up further than that. Yeah, my foot's not lined up properly. My foot is not through the hole in the bottom, so I don't have that on right. So I'll have to put that on right and then put the top on. Um, yeah, this side is on right. So that side's lined up. This side is not. The foot is stuck. It's kind of hard to. Ow, there we go. So now you can see that's just loose on there. Um, my back might have a similar problem. So I'll get that on and then put the top on, and then I think hopefully we can do a final demonstration on this. Oh, and also I did um, put the mechanism here all back together. You can see I got all my uh, snap rings back on there, C clips rather. These are E clips technically, they have the pin up there. But regardless, um, now my ribbon is properly tensioned <clears throat> and uh, does advance. So I think these shows having before with the ribbon being loose up here was just I didn't have this uh, completely assembled, but it's fine now. Definitely it looks a lot bigger with the case on. Um, and now you can see, we see our decimal point setting here, so we're sitting on zero right now, so. You can see that in the camera, hopefully. E330. That shows up. So we can do say five. Here we go, know six two five. And then for decimal points, we can try. So we can set this on max decimal points, and we should be able to do three fifty five. All right, by one one three. So on, when you're on max decimal points, it doesn't give you the decimal points, so you have to figure it out yourself like a regular um, mechanical calculator. Um, it only prints the decimal point when you're on one of the predefined settings, like if we go up to 
4, then we know we have to enter four zeros, so 3, 55, four zeros. And now, it'll print uh, 3.1415. Um, so yeah, it only prints it out on one of the predefined settings. Back to zero there. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, kind of a sad end for Martin's mechanical calculators though. You know, when they used to um, design some of the most advanced and most complex calculators in the world and then they were just reduced to rebranding other brand calculators. But um, I guess it makes kind of kind of makes sense. Um, you know, Martin, by the time this was released, Martin already had their electronic calculators on the market, so you know, I guess they knew that the end was near, and rather than invest in something that they knew was going to go away, they just uh, bought some machines from Dio, and they also rebranded some from Haman as well, too, uh, non-printing machines, but yeah, so when this machine was introduced in 1967, um, it still made, you know, some sense to buy this. Um, like I mentioned before, the Sharp introduced in 1967 the first electronic calculator under $1,000, um, which was like $999.95 or something. So we're just like barely under $1,000. Well, this was, as far as I can tell, around $600. So that would make sense. And as far as ease of use, this is, you know, looking at this, if you didn't know this, this was a mechanical calculator, you almost wouldn't know by looking at the keyboard. You know, there's no, um, you know, like funny special keys like clear register one, clear register two that a lot of the mechanical calculator at the time had, this, for all intents and purposes, basically looks like the keyboard of an electronic machine, um, which is pretty interesting. And it has the automatic decimal point, which is cool. This is the first machine I've worked on, actually, that has the automatic decimal point, so it's so pretty cool to see. Um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting machine. Um, I think after this, uh, they did introduce one more model. This is basically the same as the Deal Decima, and I think Deal also had a Decima S, I believe, which had a memory or something, I think. I don't know if Martin ever marketed that one. That one came out, I think, 69. Um, and I can't imagine they would have sold many of those because by 1970, this was available, and this only cost, I think, 345. So just for scale, I'll set that there, and you can see, taking the full view here, how much smaller that is, especially from the top. Now you can see what a difference that is. And, you know, by 1970, why would you pay twice as much for this? And you can get this for like half the price and uh, what, a 16th of the size? So, yeah, that's uh, pretty much the end right there for kind of our calculators. Um, it's a pretty cool machine though. I really like how the keyboard is pretty much the same as the electronic machines and how much they were able to automate everything. And it kind of makes you wonder if they hadn't introduced electronic calculators at this time. I wonder what the next step would have been for something like this. You know, obviously so you can add stuff like square root, but I just wonder where they would have gone next after getting to this ease of use in the mechanical machines. So let's see if the addition of a pinwheel mechanism for multiplication and division makes this machine faster than the silent speed. Now, of course, this machine's more convenient because it has the auto setup and everything in the auto decimal point management. All right, we'll set this down to max decimal points. And this will only set it to eight because this, I believe, only does, this will only do let's see, eight or nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, only eight. Um, digits there. So we'll set this to 8, and then of course we'll set everything up. Uh, 3, 55. Why are you doing that? You should not do that. Try that again. 3, 55. And 1, 2, 3. So 
silent speed is just barely faster than the uh, the deal one, but not by much. So uh, I'll pull out a reciprocating machine and we can do a comparison there. Um, and you can see just how slow the reciprocating machines really are uh, normally. And of course this one obviously prints out the result, but yeah, so didn't quite beat the silent speed, but came pretty close. This is the uh, Lago Marcino Totalius. This is a uh, true um, reciprocating machine, which means it does reciprocating for addition, or yeah, for addition and subtraction, and multiplication and division. So we can do 3, 55, and then we should need, what, uh, seven zeros? I believe that should be right. See if I can go to the right number. I'm going to do the uh, one hundred three. The same number of zeros. And then the same thing here. We saw max decimal points, three fifty-five. Divided by one one three. And here we go. Oh, that one broke. This one is not. Quickly, probably because I entered the numbers wrong. Let's try that again. I was not supposed to enter all the zeros for one one three. Helps if I know how to use my own machines. I'll try this again. Uh, three fifty five. Uh, let's see. I'll add that in. No. Line line. Three. Don't enter the zeros on that one. Three fifty five. Now let's try that again and see what we get. So that one's done. And let's see what we got. I think I did this wrong. Three point one for one five nine. Yeah, I did one extra digit. I did one extra digit on this one, so not as many zeros as I had entered. This is a miscalculation there. Try it one more time. So three fifty five. It's just that many zeros. Divided by one one three. And same thing here. Three fifty five. One one three. Um, and the reason I'm entering the zeros mainly is because this one doesn't have any sort of decimal point or, um, you know, it doesn't auto tab over to get you the most decimal points like this one will. So you have to manually uh, add a bunch of zeros to get your, your precision that you want. So let's try this one more time. Hopefully that should be correct. So we've got everything set up and here we go. So now they're the correct precision, 3.1 for 1.592, and then 3.1 for 1.592. Sure you can see that. And they look pronounced pretty much the same. They have the core system points on all the zeros because you have to add those manually. 5.13 and then the result there, and then the remainder. Pretty much the same for this. 355 divided by 113, except that this one, since it auto tabs over to get you the most precision, uh, doesn't require you to enter all those zeros after the, um, the first number there. It also prints out the remainder and the quotient. So you can definitely see how much faster this one is compared to this one. Um, that adding on the pinwheel um, markers are definitely made a difference in, as far as the uh, speed goes. Uh, yeah. Um, other cool things about this machine are the, kind of has like an auto memory type thing for chain multiplication. So for example, if we did something, if we wanted to calculate, say, you know, a power of 25, we want to multiply, you know, 25 
to the eighth or something, which would be basically multiplying 25 by 25 eight times, you can kind of split that into like, um, you know, factors where you can do like, you can multiply it out 25 times 25 eight times, or you can do like 25 squared times 25 squared four times, or, you know, um, 25 to the fourth times 25 to the fourth will get you the same thing. So basically what you can do is you can enter 25, uh, let's put this on zero first, make sure I don't mess anything up. So we enter 25 times 25, and we do equals. So now you got 25 squared. But what we can do now is we can press multiply again, equals. And now it, we didn't have to enter anything. It remembered our last result and took that um, as our entry for the next operation. So now I've got 25 times 25 is 625, which is 25 squared. And 625 times 625 is 30625. So basically now we've got our 25 to the fourth because you've got 25 squared times 25 squared is 25 to the fourth. So now we can take that. And right like that, we can get 25 to the eighth with only actually entering two numbers. You can see the results there. That's kind of a cool feature. Um, they also have, I think, we can check the brochure, but I think you can also do some kind of memory using the subtotal key. So you can see basically they're basically using the subtotal key um, as kind of like a memory function where once you enter 12 and then hit the subtotal key, it'll remember 12. And then, um, I don't know, I mean, subtotal, what we call it. That's kind of interesting. They also have this one here. So it basically says if you enter your multiplier first, um, then, yeah, then you can add number second and then, Oh, that works. Let's try that. Say we had, say you're doing like a sales tax operation or something. So let's set this to two. And let's say we have 6% sales tax. So 6% and then they hit the multiply key, I think. Let me check the directions. And then they hit the multiply key. And then they added their number. So now we would enter up, enter in what we're adding. Say we got something for, I don't know, $55 and 23 cents. Uh, so we we'll add that in. And then something for, I don't know, $45 and 89 cents. Add that in. And then they just, what, do total and then equals. So total, uh, total would print out what we got so far. So our total is $101.12. And then if we hit equal, it should multiply that by our tax, which is $6.06. .06. That makes sense. And that means if we add now, can we get the sum of our total plus our tax? It doesn't say that in the, in the example. And if we do plus. No, it didn't save the total. So you have to re-enter, I guess, re-enter the total and then add the tax to it. Kind of interesting. I well, maybe there's a way to do it, but I don't see it in the direction, so I have to play around with it. But anyway, so it's kind of interesting that you can enter your multiplier first, then enter everything you want to add up, and then hit the equals at the end and it'll multiply. It's kind of, kind of cool, but... Yeah, anyway, I think that's about it for this one. Um, the machine seems to function just fine. Um, definitely a cool machine. Like I said, kind of at the uh, tail end of the uh, mechanical calculators there. And that uh, auto and decimal point is pretty cool too. See, here's our uh, results from earlier. The addition, multiplication, and then division. Yeah, auto decimal point there. So yeah, definitely a cool machine. Um, like I said, kind of a sad end for Martin's mechanical calculators when they were reduced to 
buying uh, machines from other brands instead of designing their own, given how advanced they were in the past. But anyway, that's going to be it for this one. Hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching.